Hello, animators and artists, and welcome to another Toon Boom interview. Travis Blaze was first hired at Disney through their summer internship program, where he began his 14-year career at the studio. He has since worked as a director and animator for Cartoon Network, story artist for Disney and Rough Draft Studios, and character designer for Nickelodeon. We invited Travis onto our stream to discuss his career in animation, his role as a mentor and educator, and his experiences storyboarding for TV animation. Travis, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, and I'm glad to have you here. Uh, so, Travis, for those, uh, for our viewers who are joining us live, if you have any questions for Travis, feel free to enter them into the chat, and we might ask them on the air. Tra Travis, you've done just about every job in animation. How has your experience as an animator informed your work as a storyboard artist? Uh, you know, I a lot, and then there was a lot I didn't know. Um, I, I feel like... I feel like everything led leading up to my career starting as an intern with Disney to to you know almost a decade ago getting into storyboarding led my led me to that moment and um, I think you know my first love was animation you know moving that you know the first time I animated something across the paper and seeing it come to life and then my my true love was storytelling and then the moment I started storyboarding I realized that's where I wanted to live and I felt like a lot of ways animation brought me um, acting and, and, and emotion to the to a level that I needed jumping into storyboarding. Absolutely. So uh, a storyboard artist has a lot of responsibilities on a production. Uh, how would you describe uh, a storyboard artist's role in a typical production that you've worked on? Well, I mean, there's there's various different roles. I mean, and, and it depends really on the production you're on. Uh, you know, we, we just finished wrapping up um, this past March, our first masterclass series for TV animation. And I wanted to specifically talk about TV because the approaches of TV, there's even various ways um, artists or storyboarders artists are looked at within that industry. And then there's feature animation, which is a whole nother way, other way. I mean, the commonality to all of it is that we're storytellers, we're visual storytellers. But um, the differences becomes down to production pipelines, how how they want to tell the story, how fast it, it takes, really comes down to budget. Um, you know, a story director uh, for TV uh, might be different than a head of story for features. You know, you'll have several directors that have story artists like myself that work under those directors with a supervising director. Whereas features, you would have one head of story with a team of story artists that would tackle, um, you know, the script or the story that you're working on. The difference is also is that when you're in TV, um, you know, you have shorter deadlines typically. And um, depending on what project you're on, uh, you like with me, with TV animation, like with Disney, um, we would do 11 minute shows that we would get all, our, all to ourselves. Each story artist would be assigned an 11 minute short that we'd have four to six weeks to do. So there's, again, and there's different levels of, of that where you have story revisionists um story directors story artists and uh supervisors and heads of story so that's kind of like the lineup of the various levels of storyboard artists but the whole common thing is we're all there to visually tell the right story um that the director wants us to have, do so do you uh like having the autonomy of having a whole episode uh, to yourself or do you prefer being part of a team where you can sort of contribute things and, and have them be refined and more of a collaborative process? Well, um, they all have their their benefits and their, you know, obviously now that we're in a pandemic, um, we're all kind of working remotely. I'm used to it being, having worked remotely for the last six years, um, but I do love the collaboration. Uh, when I was working on feature films with my brother on, uh, he was working on a production called Legend of Tembo, uh, he specifically, had us team up in pairs and i really like the aspect of teaming up with somebody because when you're struggling on a on a sequence or pages of script and you need someone to talk to you could literally go over to the guy next to you or the woman next to you and go hey can you, can i pitch this to you i'd like you to see it and then they would share their ideas and and there's that that team 
aspect that's really that collaboration that really makes sense to why we do this these types of productions with animation because it is a team effort and it takes it takes all of us together to kind of think as one to uh, make the best story we can tell. Um, there's also, you know, I do like the idea of having my own script where I get to create something and say, I did this from from the start to beginning, this, this one story, this one contained idea for an episode, which is really neat. But it's still nice when I was working in-house to be able to, you know, Mike Morris, I pitched to him and uh, other friends of mine, like Brian Francis, who's a director over in, uh, a uh, tit mouth, some big mouth. Um, being able to go to those those people and be able to share your ideas and then say, hey, you know, I like that, but how about try this approach? That aspect, all of that switched now to just being online. Uh, and I love the engagement that we can do. Like when I was on features, I was able to, uh, we'd have these offbeat moments where we'd have our directors in but then we'd say hey let's all get together on Wednesdays and just have our screens up and and pretend we're in the same place at the same time and we'll draw and share our you know show and tell as we're drawing I was uh, character designing and storyboarding on, on a feature with with Warner Brothers during that time and that was really fun so um, I'd say the benefit I, I love the idea of being able to feel like you're collaborative even if we're not in-house I like that connection. I like that social uh, connectivity that um, that animation is synonymous for. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we got a question in the chat from Jedi of the Shire, and it, it made me think of some of the discussion we we're having before the stream. Okay. Um, Jedi is a Canadian animator that mainly works in kids TV, but would like to work on bigger feature level work, but doesn't want to move to the U.S. and is asking us. Um, or you specifically, are you seeing more work become more remote and is it become, going to become more borderless with a uh, working from home pipeline? You know, I'm glad that you brought that up, idea, uh, that that question, because, yeah, this this is the big topic. I, I'm a big advocator of young talent moving up and, and having opportunities. This, specifically, I have lots of friends all over the world that I wish had the same opportunities that I have. And I, and I desire that for everyone. And with this production in particular, the, when we were talking a few minutes ago, I'm on a production that literally has nobody, purposely, no one is in-house. Um, the director, the producers are all in different states. Um, the character designers and layout artists and visual designers are all over the world. And yet we are able to, we, we're having our first screening tomorrow of this feature film. And we did it in record time. Uh, we're seeing numbers going up. And and because of that, I, um, what was forced into a pandemic that we're in now where we have to work remotely, it is giving other people like yourself that are in Canada and other places in Ireland and, and you know, I was saying South Africa, people that are equally talented all over the world, I feel now have more of a shot at um, working remotely. And working remotely, we're, I'm hoping globally, uh, in terms of being paid monetarily, we're all being paid equally across the board, no matter where you live. So I do think that that is changing. Um, I do think we'll go back to the norm uh, as it was before, but I don't think it's going to go completely that way. There will be studios that will be like, nope, we all have to work in-house. Um, I know Disney is like that and other studios, but Warner Brothers has really embraced the idea of uh, working remotely. Um, as long as we're making productions and we're keeping, I mean, think about it, overhead costs. I'm saying, hey, studios, overhead costs are lower and everyone gets to work from home and we're still kicking butt on production and time. So I, I, I would, I'm rooting for the latter that we, we work remotely continually. So Yeah, the, the, there's so many possibilities with remote work that I, I, I think are really exciting. Uh, so, so the one thing I wanted to ask you about, the, the, the call we're on now is uh, an hour long. You recently ran a six-hour masterclass on storyboarding for TV animation. Uh, so, so first, I, I want to ask you, how, how was that experience? A and then I want to ask about the topics that you covered in your course. Um, so I started doing, the year ago, we opened up with Sketch to Animate, uh, which was inspired by my older brother, Aaron Blaze, who, who really pushed me to say, Travis, you know, you got a lot to teach. You need to put yourself out there and create something. So I did, I created Sketch Animate. 
for the sole purpose of visual storytelling. Um, I, my theme is, you know, every every story begins with a sketch, sketch to animate, and everything in between. That idea is I want to build a, philo- a community of storytellers, artists, because no matter what level that you're in, uh, in that production pipeline, the character designer, prop designer, it's all based on what the story is and what it dictates. And so um, I was already used to doing, over the last year, build, just building the fan base, already used to doing these two to three hour streams. I was doing uh, a pilot show, I was storyboarding a pilot show, and I, I had a three hour stream where I was just sitting there drawing on my pilot and sharing what I was doing as I was going from the script to thumbnails, and now I'm going into rough boards. Um, and my longest stream was five hours. I'm like, and I still had like 20 people watching me the entire time. I'm like, wow, people are still watching me. What's wrong with them? <laughs> but then my partners and I, we got together and said, let's, let's start doing these. Um, you know, I've always wanted to do workshops. So I, this, our first event was this past March where I wanted to teach TV animation. And I wanted to specifically target, t- you know, my approach to TV animation. And I wanted it to be a one-day course, and originally it was going to be four hours, and it ended up being like six and a half, about seven hours. And I, there was a lot. To, the thing is, there's a lot to talk about. I could have made it into a three-day, three-day workshop, but we didn't have, we didn't know what we were doing in terms of what we wanted to make sure that everyone had. So I cram-packed everything in there, and I literally just had all my notes. I had like literally notes scattered all over my wake I and mean, I just went through the list and it was six and a half hours of a list that and then before I knew it it was six and a half hours were up and I still wanted to talk more there's like no it's we're not done yet but it, it went great I'm as you can tell I like to talk a lot so <laughs> I have a lot of energy there is so much to talk about in storyboarding because uh, it, it is just a fascinating craft uh, and we actually got a really good question in the chat about it. Uh, sure. So, so you, you mentioned that it takes uh, can take four to six weeks to make a, an episode for TV. What does a typical week look like for storyboard artists leading up to that final episode? So, I mean, the way I approach, and it's very similar to like people like Brian or Joe, uh, Scott, and, and others. Um, I spend, so when we get a scene, the typical scenario is, you get a script given to you ahead of time. You, you get at least a day ahead notice to read the script, have your own little notes, and then you get brought in to do a table read with the director. And typically, the, either either if uh, somebody will go in there and we'll do a round table, and they'll, they'll, they'll do the table read because they want you to hear their inflections and they want you to know what the story is about. So it's an 11-minute script is typically between 15 to 21 pages. Uh, you know, depending on how wordy it is and how description it is, how much descriptive there is for setups. So you get your notes and then I go back to my desk and I literally spend the first week not drawing the boards, but thinking about, I'll thumbnail, I'll draw the the new characters, the new model sheets that are involved in in the script. But I spend a lot of my time in my head because I really... My I'm weird. Like when I was an animator on Lilo and Stitch, or I animated on Stitch, um, I got in this practice of visualizing um, what the scene looked like, and I and I imagined myself with a camera, and I just played it over and over and over and over again until it was so clear in my head. I just drew what I saw, and I would thumbnail out my stuff. But I once once it was clear, I I did it, and similarly I would do that with the storyboards, um, I imagine myself as the camera, the, the, the AD, the director, and, you know, because you're kind of, as a story artist, you're a layout artist, you're a character designer, you're the director, you're the AD, you're the, you're the talent, you're the actor, you're, you're all of those things because you're the first person who's going to lay the foundation that everyone else is going to follow. It's the hardest but most rewarding job I've ever had, and the great thing about it is you never stop learning. I don't care how many how many awesome things you've done. There's more awesome things to happen that you don't know. And that's what I think I love about it. I'm, I, I think of myself as a very big adult child. I, I, I've always embraced my childlike self to really dive into my imaginary world to continue doing this because 
I don't see how any other way I could do it without tapping into that. So um, once I get going, I just I just kind of barrel through it. And those that first week is doing that, but then the next two weeks is roughing out the scene, and then I show it to my director uh, if it's TV, and then they give me notes. And I go back, and then I do my first pitch. Typically at the four week mark, where I pitch it to the director, and then the director gives me. You know, in the case of Pen Zero, I love Sam Levine. He was my director twice over on a feature film. Loves notes. I embrace his notes like wholeheartedly. Um, but a lot of so I always I'm prepared to you know do a lot of drawing. Um, and that's the other thing. Don't fall in love with those boards. Just do the best you can do, and because you're going to do a lot of revisions. It just is the way it is. So and then the last two weeks after I get my notes is just getting it ready for the executives to see it. And then at that point, whether you like it or not, pencils are down, test is done, you pitch it in front of everyone, you get nervous, you screw up, but it's okay because everyone understands because they're in the same boat as you and that feels good. And then everyone has their notes, the executives get their notes and then you don't get to change it, the revisionists do because you've got to go on to the next episode. And that's the life of a TV story artist in that regard. So Travis, you started your career with a summer summer internship, yes. uh, and, and I wanted to ask you, um, who were some of the mentors that had the biggest influence on your development as an artist in this industry? Wow. Um, so there's a lot. There's not one particular person uh, per se. There's a couple. Um, my brother was a, 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 another big influence, but um, I always say that with every mentor or every person that's influenced you, they've been influenced by three other people and those three other people and those three other people. So you're getting, if you follow people's inspirations, you're getting a whole history of inspiration from them that is important. Like, you know, my brother was Glenn Keane. That was his mentor. Then I got Aaron to sort of, you know, seeing him, absorbing him through being the older, younger brother and watching him and getting the internship with Disney. Um, I had people like Alex Cooperschmidt, who, if you don't know Alex Cooperschmidt, he uh, animated, uh, he started in the Disney studio when it first started. Um, he has worked on Khan, Mulan, Aladdin. Uh, he worked on all the, he headed up a lot of the hyenas on Lion King. Uh, he also uh, headed up Stitch in Coda and Brother Bear. And I actually worked with him um, as one of the main, that was like his right-hand guy on Stitch. And I learned so much from him. And all the great supervisors, what, what I love about most things about most supervisors is their willingness to let you fall on your face. Like they'll give you like a choice scene and go, okay, run with it. And you're like, oh, and you don't know, but then you just do it. And, and, and they know when to kind of hold you up and pick you up. And they know when to kind of show you. And I love the idea of mentoring that way because there's no reason why we have to hold all of the great things to, to ourselves when there's something unique about each of us that we bring to the table that no one else, even the supervisors, could have thought of. And I, and I think that's the thing about Alex is I brought something to him that he wanted and um and he let me shine and i think that was the brilliance of who he was or who he is he also um supervised tangled the horse in tangled which is one of my favorite characters in 3d and now his his career has evolved into he oversees pretty much all of every scene that comes through he does drawovers of of the scenes he's a 3d animator and a 2d animator and so he he has kind of created a role for himself at disney um he did a lot of behind the scenes stuff where he would just supervise or look over people's work on Zootopia, which, you know, won the Oscar. Uh, he's just, he was one of my biggest influences, I think, uh, with animation. And then, you know, again, seeing Glenn Keane go through Aaron, that got to me. Um, and I've had people like the, the late press Ramanillas who also learned under, um, himself. Um, I've, you know, I've had Kathy Zielinski on Frollo and Sergio Pablo, some Tarzan, there's just a number of people that have always kind of been little influences for me throughout my career that I'm, I'm very thankful for to be a part of. So uh, one thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, what was your big surprise in the animation industry? Was there anything you didn't expect? 
I don't. That's that's kind of a. I don't know. Um, I there was. I think there's a lot of unexpected. You know, a lot of things you don't expect as you go, and I think it happens from job to job. I mean, just when you think you know everything, you don't. You get thrown a curveball, and I, I can't point out anything particular. Um, one one crazy thing uh, that was surprised me is uh, we. When we first started at Disney, we we were so excited to be a part of the Disney family, especially in Florida. We had such a unique experience there. Um, we gave our heart and souls as young adults there. Like, you know, I started at 21, and now I'm, I'm going to be 51. And I look back and go, man, I, I'm surprised at how many hours that I put in. Um, you know, as you get older, you, the, the philosophy is work smarter, not harder. Uh, I think that builds the idea with confidence as you get better with what you're what you're doing in your craft you find it easier to do things um the one surprising thing we i don't know if it's a surprise uh we had a downtime uh in between productions in florida where we were out of work for 11 months but they were under contract so we they had to pay us so for 11 months we sat around <laughs> waiting for the next big project to happen and that was the biggest surprise in the industry for me is like we always thought we would have work coming in but um there are so little artists good talent that they they had to hold us all together so we were in a downtime for like 11 months that was like one big happy surprise i guess that's never happened since but this is like when i was 25 i think it was in between like mulan and uh hunchback or something like that so yeah i don't i, I don't I, i'm trying to think of surprises like what what do you have in mind like when you when you ask the question of surprise yeah i i guess the other way i could phrase it was um are there any misconceptions that you hear about the animation industry from people who maybe aren't inside it that uh, you just know like okay well if you're just on this side of the screen you know you you know how this 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 goes uh, I think a lot of the misconception is you have you, you have an easy button that you just press and then boom, you know. Oh, the anime button. Yeah, the anime button. Um, I think people, when I that. talk to my friends that are not um, in the industry, and I explain to them, like the other day I was talking to my, my friend and I was saying, you know, um, we were debating, it was, well, when did Lilo and Stitch come out? I said, well, it came out uh, this year, but I... But I started on it four years earlier. And she goes, what do, you, what do you mean you started on it four years earlier? I said, productions, these shows just don't miraculously appear. Like, I'm, I'm on shows now that I won't be able to show my work to the world for another two years. Um, that's just how the industry is. That's The big misconception is that uh, we still, no matter how advanced we get with technology, the, there's still that that human labor that is still intense and takes time. Um, you know, an average film still takes you know two to four years, four to six years sometimes to produce and 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 create. I mean, if you think about that, that's that's someone going from ninth grade to graduation, right? That's like a whole a whole you know when you think about your teenage years, that's a long time, and that's typical. You know, the average production for a story artist is you know between six to, to 12 months. If you're, if you're one of the few that stays on the production, you could go 18 to 22 months. Um, you know, when I was storyboarding or when I was animating on Stitch, you know, the typical production was 22 to 24 months, equivalent to about two years. And before that, it was pre-production, right? It was, it was storyboarding, it was rewrites, it was reboards. Um, the other misconception is uh, animation in terms of features, not necessarily in terms of uh, TV, you'll have what we call like um, you have the budget to do five screenings, meaning we're in the middle of doing our first screening for this production that I'm on. And then we're waiting. We're all sitting there waiting for Friday's reveal. Then we're going to get the flood of notes, which means then now we have to re look at the movie, probably tear it apart and reboard it again and put it up. And you have typically three to five revisions of this to get it to a place where it needs to be before it has to go into production before you like run out of money and like okay this is it you got to go this we, this we're at the we're on the end of the, in the line 12th hour this is it and then hopefully the idea through all of the revisions you're going to have sequences that get approved 
that can go into production so that it's like a tear effect, you know, as you know, as you're fixing up the holes in the story here, some of them aren't changing structurally, they, they get to move forward into production. So there's, there's that, I think the big misconception is like how long and how much time these things take. Yeah, I think there's something about animation and the number of people who work on a production where, where someone sees the final results and they're like, wow, this is amazing. It came from space. And they don't really think about all of the labor and time that goes into it. Um, so we got a question in the chat uh, from sure. The Real Hazel, who's Real uh, a student Hazel. animator from Colorado who will be graduating soon and is wondering if there are if you find the transition difficult from TV animation to feature film animation and back and forth? Um, well, I'm kind of a person that likes new challenges. Um, I had purposely taken on the roles or actually gone after these various projects because I wanted to know what they were like. Like, um, there is, I, I think, as a, as a story, if you want to get into story, um, be as versatile as you possibly can. Learn as much as you can. Write, be a writer. Uh, learn uh, as much about the camera and layout and uh, as you can. But be as versatile. I'm meaning versatile is like um, every production is going to have its own style of boarding. Uh, and a, it's a combination of uh, the way you draw and the way you lay the camera out. Um, you know, TV animation. Some TV animation can be more like sitcom base, which is very flat, uh, close, cut up in, establishing shots. Whereas you go into, let's say, I worked on Disenchantment because I wanted to know what it was like to work on an adult show that had a different, completely different pipeline where you don't get as much creative freedom as a story artist because the script doesn't get changed. Whereas in TV, Disney or Cartoon Network, you may have an opportunity to address the script or dialogue notes say, hey, you know, what about this line here? Um, when you do that, you don't get to change anything. Plus, you also get a radio play um, that is already given to you on these adult comedy spots that don't change. They edit, the, they do the voices and it's edited and then you listen to it and you just board it. So with, with Disenchantment, they didn't want to do that typical sitcom style. They wanted to have, you know, like if two people are talking, one's here and one's here. They don't want three quarter, three quarter. They'd want, let's create creative angles of these characters that felt like you're in the moment with them. And they still wanted to have that cinematic appeal while it's still being a sitcom. Um, Big Mouth. You know, I worked on Big Mouth because uh, I wanted, that was my first time ever working in production. I wanted to know what it was like to really be in a truly adult show. And I was on the first season of Big Mouth. And it was a great experience. Um, and then I wanted to get into features because... Um, I wanted to know what it was like, what the differences were. And I'm kind of one that wants to be challenged by each one. And as I built each one, like I wanted to be able to learn comedy. I wanted to be able to learn acting. I want, I know I knew I had acting chops because I always, from my, from my acting and animation days, but I wanted to do action too. Like, I, you know, last sequence of, of uh, Super Pets that I was working, I said, hey man, can I, can I maybe get an action shot? You know, like, just try it, because there's, there's people like Ian Bombato oh, that are amazing. Like, there's this group of story artists that I look at and admire um, that are just phenomenal at these action sequences. Um, and I just always wanted to be able to challenge myself. But I think the one thing is that allowed me to be able to jump from place, because, you know, you have to have a portfolio that allows them to trust you to do that. Um, and we talked about this a few minutes ago, which was there's more to just being a good artist. You want to be versatile and you want to have different stuff. You want to be able to change up your style. And that's drawing and that's that's layout and camera. Um, but you also have to understand communication. I think one of the reasons why I've been able to go from place to place is because I have a I, I make a point to really listen, to really un ask questions and not be afraid to fall on my face, not be afraid to show my first pass because I know I'm going to get notes. And, but, but also learn to communicate clearly with them. I love being able to sit down with my directors and, and sit there and collaborate with them. Say, you mean, you know, I'll draw it like this. No, 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 we don't like this more like this. You mean like this? And they go, yeah, that's it. 
through that process, I'm learning about them. I'm learning about what they want. And through that process, they're trusting me because I am taking the time to get to know them. And I think that's the key to being successful in this industry is really communicating well, getting to know that the director and their sensibilities, not, not you, you can fall back on what you know, but remember what you know is you, what you really don't know. You want to know what you don't know in order to know what you need to know, you know? <laughs> There's that, that kind of weird, like, I want to not, I don't want it. I don't know everything. I don't intend to, but I want to know as much as I can in the process. And that's where that childlike idea of, that you need to, to kind of be creative. Um, and also, there's the other aspect, which is don't be afraid to pull from your own experiences. You know, you have something to offer as an artist, as a person, as a human being. You're 21 years, you're 51 years, whatever, wherever you're at at that particular moment, you bring all of this history from, to that present moment that you can utilize as, as fuel for your story, your storyboarding and storytelling. So, I don't know. I One of the things you mentioned uh, is that you've done work both in uh, kids TV and in adult animation. We just ran a, a bunch of panel discussions in adult animation, but I, I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think the biggest differences are on working on an adult animated show versus a kid show? Well, I mean, there, the what I've noticed, the, the big components is, is what I've noticed is that um, you typically have um well the theme thematically it's it's you know family like um like adult like big mouth is content that is for younger viewing audience although when they first debuted <laughs> i think they had the largest number of like teenagers watching the show because it's about those teenage years um with that being said the biggest difference is i think what i said before is um you have shows like the regular show which is like a uh, a story um a storyboard driven show uh, versus script driven, which is uh, you have an outline by a writer that creates this overall look and feel that you want, but you as the artist not only draws the boards, but also writes the dialogue and, and then gets punched up through the process of iterations back and forth. With a script and cartoon, like say Cartoon Network or Disney, you know, I tend to stay in the script driven world. I've never actually worked on a board driven world except for my own projects. Um, so working with a script and having in-house writers there on staff for you is 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 cool because you get to have this opportunity when you get your that script pitched to you the, the typically the, the head writers in the room with you and you get to ask questions and you get to ask freedoms if you can change dialogue up and they're typically open to it um and with adult comedy like i said before you, you don't uh the script is golden it's usually locked you don't ever change the script. You don't ever make a suggestion that you change the script. You know, like, oh, that's not funny. I'd like to write some other line. No, because usually the radio plays there. Now, that takes some creativity, some of the creativity out of it. I enjoyed it because it was a new experience for me, and it was something I wanted to learn. Um, you still get the board. You still get to, to create the, the world, uh, which is really cool. But, you, you know, that process is a lot different. They're very strict about how they want things to go because you know that writing room is typically you don't typically engage with the writers sometimes you don't even know them um you know in big mouth i'd, I'd walk by and i'd see nick kroll and and all the other producers and then there'd be the the room where you'd have 16 amazing writers in this room collaborating and talking about the script but there's definitely a separation between the artists and the, and the writers uh, whereas other shows like Disney and, and even the feature that I'm on now, um, there's definitely a hands-on collaboration. Um, you know, I made suggestions recently on a, on the script with this feature, and the writer was excited about it. And I was excited that he was excited. And I was excited that they let me allow him to have my opinion, which is really cool. Um, so I, I see those differences in in. Um, more on the how the hierarchy is and how the production pipelines work they're definitely different i don't know why that's like that i always no. often question why is why don't we do it more like tv production style why does it have to be this way why does the radio have to be locked in why can't we have a voice in terms of the dialogue but 
they also spent a lot of money for the writers. So, you know, I can understand their points of view and, and you just kind of, it, it is what it is and you just kind of work within the system. So. I think there definitely are benefits to having people on a production who don't only do that one type of production because then you do have people asking question of, hey, why are we doing it this way? Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, how has the landscape of animation changed for artists since you started your career? Wow. Well, for one, I, I used to draw on this thing called paper. What's that? <laughs> you know, I had hole punches, you know, little hole punches, and you actually had a disc, and you had this thing that had, it, it created like brown texture on the piece of paper. I think they call it a pencil. Um, and, and then I had this thing that would rub the, the paper off of it, the pencil off of it when I was making mistakes. And that would be, that would be the, the delete button that we use nowadays or the Z control Z that was my kneaded eraser. So <laughs> that would be the big difference. I was, I was, I feel very fortunate to have been able to experience that world, um, and watch this exponentially over my career, this industry change. But one of the things that I noticed through the evolution of of this technology and the way we do things, and yes, we don't really draw on paper anymore, and but we draw on our Wacom's, right? We have we have programs like Toon Boom and, and 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 other programs that allow us to do the things that we used to do. But you'd think it'd be faster. It's not necessarily faster. It's just different. And um, as we've evolved, like I've had to re imagine myself like the the days of 2d animation in the marketing world especially after brother bear uh that i worked on with coda was pretty much done in the feature market everything became 3d so you had to as an artist evolve either going you know a lot of people got out of the industry a lot of people got into 3d animation um i wanted to at that moment when things were happening i switched over to story that's when i got into story and what i realized is the one thing I had a, a really awesome producer named Pam Coates and her, she's produced so many different productions. She sat me down one day on my brother's production. And she said, what are you doing? Because I was storyboarding. And then I was also learning computer animation to be, and then teaching them acting and then doing all these other things. Why are you over there doing this when you're storyboarding? I go, I don't know, because my brother told me to, <laughs> and he did. And she says, no. She says, I'm going to tell you something. Be a story artist. She says, no matter how this industry evolves, there will always be a need for a story artist. No matter how advanced things get, you'll always need a story artist. She said that over a decade ago, and it's still the same poignant thing that I have ever heard anyone tell me. Because if you think about it, we're still drawing we're drawing whether drawing digitally or not we're still having to visually put that stuff down whether it translates into a live action or stop motion or 3d it doesn't matter it all starts with that storyboard every single time every time and that's what excites me about storyboarding and that's why i i love this i love what i do i love it i, I love that i can evolve with the industry and still do what I, and, and still have a job, which is kind of cool. Uh, Travis, another thing I wanted to ask you about was, uh, so, so you produce free videos about animation and provide advice for artists on mm -hmm. sketchedanimate.com. Mm -hmm. And I, I really wanted to ask, why is mentorship and sharing knowledge so important to you? Because I think as, as we learn and as we get older, it is our obligation as artists, as older artists, to share that with the younger generation, to the next people, because they're the ones that are going to carry the torch. And if we don't give that knowledge and we don't give our experiences, good, bad, or indifferent, we're just going to lose our culture. We're going to lose our identity as, as what we created as a craft and, and as an industry and as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a culture. You know, storytelling is one of the oldest forms of art. As long as man is, and humans, excuse me, humans have been around, story has been there. It's how we've survived. It's how we have carried truths and, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. H history is made by stories. And 
uh, I don't know. I, I think mentoring is is essential, and um, I really feel like I'm selfish because I benefit from it. I benefit being a mentor because I'm learning something that I've never learned before. Every time I have someone that comes in, I privately tutor as well as I I do my live tri- Twitch streams where I offer drawovers, and um, and you know even with my live streaming where I was just drawing arc my pilot show and I was just sharing what I was doing. I, I want to give people an inside look into my world as, as or and and when I make a mistake and and you know it's it's not glamorous and it's boring sometimes and um but at the same time being a mentor really challenges you. It's like it puts everything you've learned to the test. Do you know what you're talking about or are you full of crap? And and it's it's really and you get challenged with questions that make you think about the things that you do. And I and I, I really think it's every time I teach somebody something, I walk away with a new understanding about myself and I and apply it to the next thing that I do. So yeah, it's important. I think every senior person that's out there like me needs to be a teacher. For many artists, um, the first opportunity can be very difficult to find. Do you have any advice for artists who are looking for their first job in animation? Um, that's a kind of that's a really good question because so many artists aren't taught. They're taught technical skills when they're in school, but they're not taught real life skills. They're not taught what it means to negotiate, what it means to to market yourself, what it means to communicate. Uh, we have a lot of kids today that aren't as, you know, comfortable interview in interviews or talking to other people. And um, you have to get over that fear. I feel like being being vulnerable is where you grow. And when you are a student just starting out, um, you have to learn confidence that no matter, you know you don't know something, but you have the capacity to want to learn it. And that's what studios are looking for. They're looking for talent. And they're looking for people that have the willingness and open mindedness to learn something new, because that's what you're doing. You're going you're you spent four years in school to learn technical aspects of things that you you are going to be able to learn a whole nother level of things that are going to be second nature to you that are going to be instinctual. Um, And you're going to have to trust yourself along the process and you're going to make mistakes and not to be afraid to make mistakes. That's where you grow. Um, but the, I think a lot of studios, they're looking for people that are having willingness to want to learn, to be molded. Um, that's what I, how I was when I was starting out. You know, I was very fortunate in, in having this career that I've had, but, and, and I make, I acknowledge it daily that I'm, I'm thankful for it. And, um, you know, when I was working on Frollo, I remember, Everyone was out of work, uh, sitting at the studio waiting for the next project to come through. And we were in Florida, and I got a, a call from one of my friends in LA who said, "Hey, I just finished Pocahontas, and they were like, um, I have to relay this compliment to you because Glenn Keane said he liked this one scene, and you did it." So I said, "Oh, I'll, I'll relay the message." And he said, "Hey, what are you doing? Are you work? What are you working?" I said, "I'm." we're in downtime, we don't know what we're doing yet. And she said, he's, he said, well, there's an opportunity to work on Frollo if you wanted to work on it. And he says, all you have to do is, why don't you call the producer? And at the time, like, no one, like, what do you mean call a producer? He's like, just call the producer. And so I was, I was like, scared as anything. And because I'm like, this guy doesn't know who I am or whatever. And so I, I said, okay, fine. I called the person who's in LA and I said, hey, I know you're working on this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, my name is so-and-so. He goes, oh yeah, I know who you are. It turns out this producer, he knows everybody. He like takes the point to know everyone in the studio. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. And then I said, I want to do this. And he goes, really? And so he went back to the supervisor and the super was like, no, <laughs> I don't want to work with another person remotely. Her half her crew was in France and the other half was going to me was going to be in Florida and she's in Los Angeles. She didn't want to work with another person. But he saw somebody who was willing to learn to be molded and want to, to, to just go under the rain. And um, it was the best 
I loved it because it gave me an opportunity um, to fly out to LA to learn under her. And um, again, in terms of mentoring, um, I, I, I think I was stubborn in that I wanted that opportunity and she finally gave in and allowed me to have that opportunity. And it turned out to be great. Um, and those are the things that I talk about where you don't, you can't be afraid to take a risk. You can't be afraid to ask, to be, to ask, you know, I was, was told the squeaky wheel gets the oil and I took it to heart that day. <laughs> and I was the loud person that called and said, Hey, I want to have this opportunity, but they saw something in me, um, that allowed me to take it to the next level. So, um, there's definitely a fear that artists, students have that, you can't be afraid. Um, but also do your research too. Know what studios you want to work for. I know everybody, so many people want to work for Disney, but there's so many other amazing studios out there. Like one of my favorite, favorite, favorite studios is Cartoon Saloon. They have produced some of the most beautiful, most rewarding storytelling movies. Breadwinner to Song of the Sea. And the Ireland's Secret beautiful the too. And Wolf Walkers. Just, what's that? Ireland is beautiful. So, oh, uh, yeah. I, I, had a, I had a rare opportunity to go to Kilkenny, and, and they gave me a tour of the studio. And wow, my hat's off to them. They're, they're, they're just a wonderful film uh, produ uh, studio to kind of do. But like I said, there's so many places where you can learn from that. Even if you don't get it to hear that, oh, I want to be here. There's a hundred other studios out there that can give you just as much experience and knowledge to build into your career. Yeah. So, uh, Travis, I wanted to give you some time to talk about some of the projects you're hosting on your website and other personal projects. Uh, so, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing on SketchToAnimate.com? So, SketchToAnimate.com is uh, a place right now. We just built our storefront. Uh, we are going to be this year launching our very first uh, tutorials. We're, we're working on one right now. Um, we're also going to be uh, doing our second workshop. And the idea behind Sketch Anime is um, not only are we developing original content like art and, and different other stories, but really it, it was a platform to build a community of storytellers where we have a Discord now for Sketch to Animate where artists can collaborate and share together. We've got about 500 plus people there now. Um, we have our own Instagram, of course, that we share. And then we have Twitch which is an extension of Sketch to Anime on the educational platform. Um, look out for, you know, right now, if you go to our site, you will, there won't be any tutorials. Uh, we'll have our um, T-shirt um, that will be selling on there. But really, the, the goal, you know, we've been taking baby steps. The goal is to get our first tutorials out there. I've been giving free tutorials and, and advice to people because I want them to know that we're here for them. And uh, that's why, uh, besides Sketch to Animate, the website and the store that we're where we're going to be doing uh, the various tutorials. We also have Twitch stream um, that we're building at the moment where I offer it's called draw over Mondays. Uh, draw over Mondays is essentially that um, I learn how to become a better artist through draw overs through working in animation where Alex would sit down and look at my scene and he would draw over my drawings to kind of show me what direction he wanted me to go in and through that process i learned new things every time we do storyboards we're getting drawovers from our directors that drawover process is a learning process that i think is invaluable for the artist to take it to the next level so i decided that i wanted to do that on mondays um, we don't always get people turning in stuff and so when that happens i, I end up talking about animation or character designing or actually draw something or people challenge me to draw something in, in that moment. And what we do is we offer, if you go to DrawOverMondays at SketchToAnimate.com, you can submit anything. It, the three things we ask people to submit, and, and to me it's because I'll be the one doing this, and I have a, uh, a guy named Wink Winkler who is my co-host in Alabama. Him and I uh, do this thing and we, we go over character designs, storyboards or animated scenes and we sit there we have them ask us questions what is it that you want to know what would you like us to provide for you uh, so i kind of know what you want in terms of the draw over and i'll sit down and i literally will draw over and we'll talk about it and and they'll ask us questions through the chat room and and this is a, an opportunity to have a, an artist like myself 
draw over your stuff and give you advice in, in at least the way I approach things. And um, I don't know anyone else that does this, honestly. Like, I wanted to do something different, and it's free. You know, you come to Twitch. I mean, we ask if you want to support the Twitch, you know, the channel. It's great. But, you know, come on board and, and basically, you know, submit your work. And, and I love getting that because, it's, again, it's, it helps me <laughs> to become a – you know, there's challenges. There's sometimes where I see people submit work and I go, what do you want me to draw? This is beautiful. And they're like, really? And I'm like, yeah. This is... And then I'll go, okay. and they'll ask me something specific and I'll just start drawing over it. And it just kind of, you know, it's an opportunity for you to get advice from someone who's actually in the industry. And and I wanted to be able to share that information to you. So that's that's one of the big things we do. And then um, in terms of side projects, you know, we have our, our art show and we've got several other productions. And I have this rare opportunity, I'm excited, that I'm story, currently thumbnailing and storyboarding for uh, my brother's snow bear project. So he's asked me to help him storyboard. And so I'm going to be doing that. And actually, that's what I'm doing right now. So after we get off really the phone exciting. or this, this meeting, I'll be, I'll be doing that. So I'm kind of excited about it. Yeah. I think and we have time to sneak in one more question. So sure. I, I just wanted to ask, um, is there anything that you'd recommend our viewers uh, watch, read, or listen to? Uh, in terms of what? I mean... Anything. I, I absorb as much... If you want to be a storyteller, be a good writer. Read books. Listen to podcasts. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be truthful. I'm not the biggest reader. But I force myself to read, and I also listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, books on tape have been phenomenal for me, especially with with my hyper activity energy. Um, I listened to the whole Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy during Brother Bear, which is one of my favorite films or That's one of my favorite stories. Um, and you know, observe as much as you can around you. Really take notice of life around you you know take a sketchbook get away from the computer grab your sketchbook and get out there i know we're in a pandemic i know that this has changed a lot of things but you can still have a, a, a sketchbook with you um because i feel it's invaluable to have that right keep a journal write notes write thoughts or ideas down um, i have sketchbooks upon sketchbooks of ideas and thoughts that i i keep and then you know, I'm constantly absorbing the uh, watching live action films and, and other films to kind of see how people approach story. Um, it's funny, there's a lot out there, but you never find anything to watch, it seems like. Um, that's why I say go to books, you know, write poetry, write your own things. Like, you know, I wrote my first poem a month, uh, you know, three weeks ago for the first time, which it was really exciting to do. I, I feel like any place that you can flex your creative skill set as a as an artist, visual storyteller, um, all of those things are going to benefit you in in that. So, and get, and also don't be afraid to make mistakes and share. You know, I like sharing my my things with others so that I can get information from them and feedback. I like getting feedback because it helps me. So. All right, Travis, thank you so much for joining us for this week's Toon Boom interview. I, I hope this was, yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I was honored to be asked to do this and um, I was really excited. I hope I hope what I've shared with you guys has been beneficial and informative and um, look forward to working with you guys again in the future. All right, so uh, our viewers might be interested in uh, something we published on our website recently. We, we have the adult animation white paper at toonboom.com. Uh, and you can visit blog.toonboom.com to see uh, a article uh, with an excerpt from our panel discussion that we had a few weeks ago. Next week, we're inviting Colin Bennett onto the stream for an interview who uh, our viewers might know better as Onion Skin. I'll be asking about his YouTube channel and experiments with rigging tools and Harmony Premium, so you won't want to miss our conversation then. Until next time. Oh, can I can I say one more thing? Yes, yes, yes you can, of course. Oh, okay. No, I was just, we, we didn't talk about this before, but um, if you're going into TV, 
and this is the plug for Two Boom. Storyboard Pro is probably the one main software you do really need to learn. I taught it during my master class. It is essential in storyboarding and TV specific. Uh, people do it in features as well, but it, the pipeline is pretty much where if you don't have it or don't know it, either they will give it to you and you have to learn it, or you buy it for yourself and get it. But Storyboard Pro is it will be an essential tool uh, for that process in terms of technical software. So that's my plug for that. We didn't ask Travis to say that, but if you go no, you to toomboom.com, you can download a 21-day yes. trial. <laughs> you did not ask uh, me, but I, I will say it is important. All right. Thank you so much. And until <laughs> next time. <laughs>